Section 1 of The Kidnapping of President Lincoln and Other War Detective Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Melodia Carey. The Kidnapping of President Lincoln and Other War Detective Stories by Joel Chandler Harris. Why the Confederacy Failed, Part 1. When the surrender of Lee's army brought the Southern Confederacy to a sudden end in 1865, not one Southerner in a hundred had prepared his mind for the event. It came as a stroke of lightning out of a clear sky, but there were a few who thought they knew why the surrender came, who had anticipated it, in a vague way, a year or more before the event. And of these few, there were two men who regarded the outcome as a result of the direct interposition of providence, although this belief did not cause them to bear with resignation the cruel wounds which the result inflicted on their hopes and their fortunes. They gave good reasons for their foreknowledge of the collapse, reasons which the attentive reader will doubtless be able to discover for himself when the facts are laid before him. When the deadly game of war began in earnest, the southern leaders found it necessary to depend almost entirely on blockade running as the means of communicating with their agents abroad. But this method was a skittish one at best. Comparatively few men could be induced to engage in it and those who were willing were just the men whose services could be better employed in other directions. More than that, the blockade was becoming more real and, consequently, more serious every day. No plan to elude the increasing vigilance of the blockaders could be looked upon as certain or definite. It was a game of hazard, thrilling enough to attract the reckless and adventurous, but dangerous enough to repel all others. One day with another, the advantages all lay with the grim war vessels that rocked lazily up and down just outside the southern harbors. Therefore, it was necessary to hit upon some plan more definite and systematic to enable the Confederate government to communicate with its agents in the North, in Canada, and in Europe. Communication with Washington was easy, as John Omohundro, well known after the war as Texas Jack, and his companion scouts were demonstrating every day. But it had also been demonstrated that it was a risky business for any scout or spy to walk out of Washington day or night with an incriminating map or drawing or document concealed on his person. Many an innocent countryman going away from Washington after selling his produce was suddenly seized and stripped naked, being compelled to remain in this plight while the lining was ripped from his coat, if he had one, and from his boots. He might protest tearfully or threaten loudly. It was all one to those who were submitting him to this rough investigation. Events of this kind necessarily went far to make the traffic in contraband information across the Potomac as dangerous as running the blockade. Omahundro kept it up from pure love of excitement and adventure and played his cards with such apparent boldness and indifference that the cold eye of suspicion never once glanced in his direction. But he and the few others who followed his initiative were not equal to the necessities of the Confederate government, and so it was decided that the New York Hotel, so popular with Southerners before the war, should be the center to which information should be sent and from which it should be distributed. I saw an announcement the other day to the effect that the old hotel had been closed to the public, and by this time, no doubt, its place has been taken by one of those unsightly and ridiculous structures which stand for pretty much all that is concrete and real in our commercial environment. In that event, the old building has been demolished and carted away as so much rubbish. But if that rubbish should find a voice, how many strange stories it could tell! The flat roof covered, and the dull, unattractive walls concealed, a thousand mysteries. Now, as Mr. Lincoln used to put it, no government could sleep soundly while such a man as Secretary Stanton was stamping about in the corridors, kicking chairs over, and breaking bell cords. The government, consequently, was not asleep. The great secretary had early knowledge that something suspicious was going on in and around the New York Hotel and the agents of the Secret Service, as well as the most expert detectives the world could produce, gave it their undivided attention for many weary months. 
they followed many a promising clue to its unpretentious entrance, only to see it disappear, or entered its plain and silent corridors, only to come away baffled and amazed. For while the government was wide awake, the hotel seemed to be asleep. Porters, waiters, bellboys, even the guests moved about with a noiseless politeness. To enter the dining room of the hotel was to take refuge from the chaotic rumble and rattle of Broadway was to go, in fact, many steps toward the subdued literary atmosphere of Washington Square. The hotel itself, in its own proper person, was supposed to have no knowledge of the interest which the government was taking in the movements of its guests. At any rate, it betrayed no irritation, and was neither surprised nor alarmed. It went to bed early, arose at dawn, and lay sprawling in sun or rain day after day, to all appearances blissfully ignorant of the secret inquest which the government was holding over its corpus. As a matter of fact, however, there was not an hour of the twenty-four when the old hotel was not wide awake, and fairly quivering with eagerness to take advantage of every instant's carelessness on the part of the cordon of gentlemanly spies and detectives fairly quivering and quaking with eagerness, and yet as silent, as motionless, and as patient as the animals whose instincts and necessities compel them to catch and kill their prey. No writer has ever hit off this animal characteristic in a phrase. To describe it, you need a term that is a hundred times more expressive than wariness or cunning, and that gives a new illumination and a deeper meaning to patience. On the day before Christmas in the year 1863, about four o'clock in the afternoon, Captain Fontaine Flournoy, he was made a colonel later, alighted from a cab and entered the office of the New York Hotel. He paused in front of the clerk's desk and looked about him, as if in doubt or perplexity, or as if seeking for a familiar face. Though dressed in the garb of a civilian, his figure was still military. I was expecting to meet my son, he explained to the smiling clerk. I think he arrived this morning, said that functionary. Is that his handwriting? He pointed to a signature on the register. Emery W. Hunt, Montpellier, Vermont. Captain Flournoy gave a grunt of satisfaction and signed beneath it, Frederick J. Hunt, U.S.A. A gentlemanly-looking person, promenading about the office, approached the desk and inspected the signature. Show the gentleman to 322, said the clerk to a porter, and the two went upstairs. The porter, inspecting the tag of the key, saw that it was for room 328. He did not pause to correct the error, but showed the guest to 322, went in, closed the door carefully, and proceeded to usher the captain through connecting rooms until 328 was reached. In that apartment, a half-dozen men were grouped around the table. They appeared to be playing dominoes, and were so intent on the game that only one of them looked up. Meanwhile, Captain Flournoy unfastened his valise, took out a bundle of papers, and laid it upon the table. Then he rearranged the contents of the satchel and was escorted back to 322, one of the group playfully throwing a kiss after him. In all this, he was simply following to the letter the careful instructions that had been given him in Washington with respect to his movements. This was his first experience in work of this kind, and the precautions he saw taken on his behalf at every turn in crossing brought home to him in the most vivid way the dangerous character of his mission. If this danger had taken tangible shape, or had assumed actual proportions such as may be seen when a battery of guns spits out shot and shell from its red and smoking mouths, he would have known how to face it. But to be walking in the dark, to be groping blindly, as it were, with the possibility of a long imprisonment, or even the gallows at the end of the tangle, this was enough to put even his stout nerves to the test. More than this, on his own responsibility, he had taken it upon himself to deliver in person to the authorities in Richmond the most important document he had received at the federal capital. This document he had detached from the rest, and now had it stored away in the lining of an undergarment. 
It would have been no relief to Captain Flournoy if he had known that the document had been missed by the War Department not twenty minutes subsequent to its delivery into his hands, that the worthy official who had it in charge had been promptly clapped into the old capital prison, and that he himself had been accompanied from Washington by a special detective in whom Secretary Stanton had the utmost confidence. This official had long desired an opportunity to uncover the conspiracy that had its site in the New York Hotel, and he rejoiced now to find that he had run his game to earth in that quarter. His name, which was Alonzo Barnum, will have a familiar sound to those who saw it on the title page of one of the most interesting volumes published directly after the war. It was entitled, From Harlem to the Antarctic. Mr. Barnum shook himself as he entered the hotel and smiled when he contemplated the registry book. When did Hunt arrive, he asked, as he signed what he called his traveling name. Which one? the clerk asked blandly. Why, Frederick, of course. About ten minutes ago. Want a room? Well, I'm sorry, but we're full to the roof. It often happens close to the holiday season. We may have one vacant before night. Shall I save it for you? Certainly, said Mr. Barnum. Will you send my card up to Hunt? The bland and rosy clerk turned to a tall, dignified-looking man who was standing near the counter. He was in the evening dress, and the garb showed that he was either a gentleman preparing to attend some social function or a dining-room servant. His countenance and his air were those of a man of the world. As a matter of fact, he was the head waiter of the hotel and something more. McCarthy, said the clerk, Will you shove this into room 322 on your way to the dining room? The porter will bring an answer. With pleasure, sir, replied the head waiter. He took the card and marched up the stairway. At room 322, he stopped and knocked and entered without an invitation. I beg your pardon, sir, he said. I am the head waiter. A gentleman has sent up his card. Well, I must shake hands with you, McCarthy. Omohundro has been telling me about you. "'What a boy that is!' exclaimed the head waiter. "'And so this is Captain Flournoy? "'Upon my word, sir, we are well met. "'Do you know this man Barnes? "'Amos Barnes it is. "'The cabman was telling me that he came on your train from Washington. "'He ordered his cab to follow yours, and he has no baggage.' "'Captain Flournoy frowned slightly and then smiled. "'I'm green in this business,' he said. "'But my impulse is to take the bull by the horns. "'I shall invite this man up and then deal with him as circumstances suggest. I'll shake your hand once more, exclaimed McCarthy, jubilantly. Barring Omohundro, you're the only one of the whole crew that didn't want to crawl under the bed on the first trip. He went to the door, called to the porter, who was waiting outside, and said, Johnny, go down and tell Mr. Barnes that Major Hunt will be glad to see him in 322. When Mr. Barnes entered the room, McCarthy, the head waiter, was standing by the fireplace talking. He was saying, that boy of yours, Major, has grown since last summer. I saw a good deal of him when I went to Montpelier, and the questions he asked about the city, sir, twould amaze you. He's uptown at a matinee. Excuse me, sir, this to the redoubtable Mr. Barnes or Barnum. Captain Flournoy was politeness itself. He placed a chair for his visitor and seated himself on the side of the bed in an unceremonious way. The head waiter bowed himself out. There was a moment's hesitation on the part of the detective. He also was to take the bull by the horns. My friend, he said, squaring himself in his chair, let us deal plainly with each other. Your name is not Hunt, and my name is not Barnes. In regard to personal matters, you will speak only for yourself, said Captain Flournoy with a smile. Very well. I will speak now of a matter impersonal. During the last few days, a document of immense importance has been abstracted from the War Department. I am well aware of that, remarked Captain Flournoy. Otherwise, I should be elsewhere at this moment. It contains the outlines of plans that cannot be changed at a moment's notice. Precisely. Now that document, said the detective, is worth to the government at least five thousand dollars in gold, much more perhaps, certainly not less. Captain Flournoy placed one pillow on another and leaned back in a restful attitude. If I thought the government would pay no more than five thousand dollars for the recovery of that document, I wouldn't move a hand in the matter, he declared. The detective arose from his chair and Captain Flournoy sat bolt upright on the bed. Now, what is the use of beating about the bush? asked the detective. Don't be impertinent, my friend, said the captain. You are a southerner. 
Why, so is General Thomas. I'll bet you ten dollars that the document is in your valise there, declared the detective. Done, said the captain, reaching out and placing a gold piece on the table. Mr. Barnum did likewise, whereupon Flournoy kicked the valise toward him and pocketed the money. But the detective refused to search the valise. Perhaps he feared some trick. The frankness of his opponent was calculated to baffle him. I was mistaken, he said, and then hesitated. At that moment, the door opened, and McCarthy stuck his head in. His face was convulsed with laughter. Excuse me, sir, he said, but I thought maybe you'd like to see a funny sight. Two government detectives have cornered a chap in 328, and they're making him unload papers enough to line the hotel pantry. If you want to see him, sir, step right this way. He came into the room, unlocked the connecting door, and pointed with his hand. Two rooms away, angry voices could be heard in altercation. The three went as rapidly as they could, McCarthy bringing up the rear. In 328, the gas was turned low. In one corner was a man apparently at bay. He had a pistol in his hand. Over against him were two men who had him covered with Colt's revolvers. I'll not surrender the paper to you, he was saying. I'll see you dead and die myself first. You have treated me like a dog. What is it all about? asked Mr. Barnum, advancing into the room. The door behind him closed, and the three men lowered their weapons. The man, who had been at bay in the corner, lounged up to the detective with a grin, saying, Well, I'll be switched, Colonel, if you ain't a daisy from the county next to joinin'. Come, sir, cried the head waiter. His voice was harsh and stern, and his attitude was that of a commanding officer. Come, sir, this is no time for buffoonery. All right, Cap. I only allowed for to kiss him for his ma. The head waiter laid his hand on the shoulder of Mr. Alonzo Barnum. You have no need to be told what has happened. You are doing your duty as you see it. We are doing ours. It rests with you whether you leave this house with your life. McCarthy paused, passed his hand over his face, and the gesture transformed him into a head waiter again. He turned to Captain Flournoy with a deferential smile. Will you have dinner now, sir? It is ready. It is not necessary to relate here the experience of Mr. Alonzo Barnum. It is sufficient to say that he awoke one morning and found himself on a vessel that a puffy little tug was towing through the bay. In a little while, the tug loosed its grip, and the vessel, a Swedish bark, swung slowly around in the current as the wind filled her sails. Slowly, city and harbor faded from view, and Mr. Barnum was at the beginning of the long voyage, which he has so graphically described in his book. What a pity he did not take it upon himself to begin it by presenting the details of his experiences immediately previous to his voyage. Such an introduction would have given it a human as well as a historical interest. Captain Fernoy followed the head waiter down the stairway to the second story, and so into the dining room. He observed quite a flutter among the waiters when their chief entered. It was as if a military company had been suddenly given the command, Attention! Captain Flournoy was conducted to the first table to the left of the door as he entered. At this table he had no company, but before he had finished the first course, a guest had seated himself in the chair opposite. This newcomer had hardly given his order for soup and fish before the head waiter approached Captain Flournoy with the most deprecatory air, remarking, I'm very sorry, sir, but the sauterne is out. Is there nothing else on the card to your taste? He held the card out and across its face Captain Flournoy saw written, Watch out! No, I'll have a pony of brandy after dinner, but that I can get at the bar, said the captain. I'm sorry enough, sir. You could do better than that in Montpelier. At your house, I mean, sir, not at the hotel. No, no, not at the hotel, the head waiter went on, keeping an eye on the men under him. And yet, said the captain with a smile, transferring his thoughts to his own home in the far southern town. I used to think that the old hotel was a very fine affair. Give me your wine card, the guest opposite suddenly demanded. Certainly, sir, replied the head waiter, producing it instantly. The guest took it, turned it over, and remarked, Why, I saw you writing on it a while ago. What I wrote, sir, is in a very blunt hand. I simply marked out the pints of Sauterne. He pointed to the erasure with the pencil which he had in readiness for the guest's order. Captain Flournoy leaned back in his chair and wondered in what school of experience this hotel servant had learned his adroitness, his tact, and the composure which marked his acts and his utterances. It was all so admirable and yet so simple, 
and there was a certain incongruity about it too that caused the captain to laugh inwardly, though outwardly he was gravity itself. If the whole scene had been especially devised to compel the guest opposite to show his hand, it could not have succeeded better. Before the guest could return the card, the head waiter had gone to the door to usher in a number of newcomers. When these had been comfortably seated, he returned, took the card, and examined it. No order, sir? A half pint of claret, said the guest, curtly. Evidently, his temper was somewhat ruffled. In fact, he was hot. Though the weather outside was cold enough to make a pig squeal, he was restless and expectant too, for he moved nervously in his chair and drummed on the table and kept his eyes on the entrance, and his anxiety betrayed itself even when his dinner had been served. Several times the head waiter was called to the door and had conferences with persons in the corridor. After one of the interviews, he returned with a slip of paper in his hand and went about from guest to guest, showing it and apparently making inquiries. Finally, he came to Captain Flournoy, still holding the slip of paper. Do you happen to know, sir, a gentleman by the name of Barnes, Amos Barnes? His voice was modulated to the pitch of respectful anxiety. Why, I know him casually, Captain Flournoy responded carelessly. He called at my room an hour ago. Do you see him in the dining room, sir? There is great inquiry for him. He seems to be wanted at the nearest telegraph office. The captain turned in his chair, putting on his glasses as he did so, and glanced at the occupants of the various tables. No, he said presently, I see no one that resembles him. May I ask you an impertinent question, remarked the captain's vis-a-vis, -vis, as the head waiter resumed his place near the entrance. If it is a necessary one, certainly. Why did Barnes go to your room? May I give you a frank reply? I should appreciate it. Well, said Captain Flournoy, he called on me because I was a stranger. Did he explain his visit? He did. He suspected that I was a Confederate spy. He explained that a very important document had been abstracted from one of the departments at Washington. To take the edge off his duty, he wagered that the document was in my valise. He laid the wager and lost. If you will pardon me, sir, I'll say that you don't look like a person who would permit his valise to be searched in this way. Well, when Mr. Lincoln permits Stanton to send him word that he's a fool, why should the small fry resent the liberties taken with them by those who are doing their duty? Captain Flournoy leaned back in his chair and regarded his opponent with a smile. As he did so, the head waiter came forward with a deferential bow. Two gentlemen at the farther table, sir, request that you join them before you go out, he said. They have a bottle between them, sir, and it would be as well for someone to share it with them. A peal of gleeful laughter and the clinking of glasses justified the suggestion. I'll be with them in a moment, Flournoy remarked. Your venison is famous today, McCarthy. So it is, sir. So it is, assented the head waiter as he moved away. In a moment he had returned, ushering a new guest to the table at which Captain Flournoy sat. This new guest, by preference, took the chair next to the gentleman who had engaged Flournoy in conversation. He can't be found, said the newcomer to his neighbor. Well, he knows what he is about, remarked the other, and then the two put their heads together and engaged in a confidential talk. Flournoy took advantage of this to accept the invitation extended him by the lively occupants of another table at the farther end of the room. He had never seen either of them before, but under the circumstances this made no difference. They made a very noisy demonstration over his arrival, slapped him on the back, and displayed a familiarity which at any other time Captain Flournoy would have resented. They told jokes at his expense. Did you ever hear what Hunt said to his brigadier when the latter reprimanded him for not falling back before the rebels at Stony Creek? asked one in a loud voice. No, no, cried the others. Let's have it. Why, said the first one, drawing himself up and screwing a good-humored countenance into an appearance of severity, he asked this question, when was a soldier ever censured for standing his ground? They were cries of good, the sound of enthusiastic thumping on the table, and other symptoms of unusual hilarity that carry their own explanation with them. But in the midst of it all, one of Flunoy's unknown friends gave him to understand that the officers and detectives of the Secret Service were stationed in the corridors, and that in all probability he would be placed under arrest the moment he left the dining room. Well, what is to be will be, remarked the captain. McCarthy is coming this way, said the other, and as he's smiling will watch his maneuvers. In fact, the somewhat stern features of the head waiter were beaming. He snapped his fingers, and a waiter stationed himself behind the captain's chair. 
The head waiter snapped his fingers again, and from the kitchen entry came swarming a dozen waiters. They moved about from table to table, crossing and recrossing one another, and creating quite a stir, though the tables were now well emptied of guests. From the front of the dining room, this movement must have seemed to be very like confusion, but to an experienced eye, it was the result of much drilling and practice. What it lacked was formality. There is a towel by your chair, sir, said the head waiter to Flournoy. When you stoop to pick it up, throw it over your left shoulder, turn your back to the front, allow your head and shoulders to droop, and then go out into the kitchen. End of section one. Recording by Maria Melodia Carey.